Good evening, folks. Welcome. We'll get started in a few minutes. We'll let some stragglers join us. So feel free to get a drink, get a slice of pizza, chat amongst yourselves, play the drop game. We will disable the drop game during the presentation so we don't get too distracted. Uh, with us this evening, we've got Jeremy Clark all the way from Washington State. So he was kind enough to answer the call when we were looking for virtual speakers. So very excited to have him talking about get funky delegates in C sharp. I'm your host, John Calloway. Clayton Hunt is our co-host and technology extraordinaire who's eating pizza and drinking his beverage of choice as well. You told everybody to get pizza. How is the audio out there chat? Everything sound good? Oh, yay! <laughs> Can't hear Clayton? Should be able to. Oh, was it because I was whispering? Yeah, it was probably because you were whispering. <laughs> Clayton needs to be louder or everyone needs to be louder. I mean. I should be I should be loud enough now. <clears throat> OK, yeah, I was just speaking softly. He was whispering. OK, yeah. Guys are having me worried. You have no idea how much I've been struggling with this audio. <laughs> so this is the stpete.net meetup. Uh, we do try to continue to have a session a, a month. Uh, I believe this month we're going to have two sessions. Uh, we've got to get funky understanding delegates in .net with Jeremy Clark this evening in two weeks. We'll have Steve Lorello talking about an introduction to computer vision in .NET. Then in November, we'll have Michael Stark talking about Azure Bot Composer. Uh, so please do follow us on Meetup. I'll post the link here. Um, RSVP for all of our sessions, all of our programs. Be sure to join in the conversation. Clayton is getting after that pizza, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, please do RSVP. Please share with your coworkers, colleagues, anyone that you think might be interested. Share with others in, in other cities. So with that, do we have anybody from out of town, out of state, besides Jeremy, who's all the way from Washington State? Who else do we have outside of the Tampa area, outside of Florida, outside of the country even? Might we do an in-person anytime soon? Um, 
I'm not so sure that we're ready for that quite yet in Florida. Uh, when it is safe to do so, I'm sure we will get back to in person. Uh, you were supposed to get pizza. Did you not receive yours? Freaking Ward is in Indiana, That's where there's he's more a, than he's corn. A terrible person. <laughs> He did not Clayton. make me more macaroni before he left, and I am very disappointed. Clayton does, in fact, know who freaking word is. He doesn't just randomly call people terrible. <laughs> Don't lie to them, John. <clears throat> we're, we're putting on a good face here. You also didn't turn on my background. I'm still green. It ain't easy being green. No, whatever. I haven't set that up for the meetup yet. No, I'll, I'll do it. I'm not sure time. it matters. Yeah, I think Clayton, no, well, yeah, freaking Ward was supposed to send out the pizza before he left. We've got Virtua Boza, who I imagine is also in the Tampa area, unless he's traveling. Bobby Donovan, not a clever handle. Drop game. <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a few more minutes. Virtual Boza had Nashville hot chicken. Chicka chicka bang bang. Is that local? Well, where? Chicka chicka, chicka bang bang. They're, they're in Tampa on Henderson. I don't get out much. We were talking about before going live uh, the the Google email saying that see where you've traveled for the past month and it's like a couple of blocks I feel like there should be a winner every time there's a drop game but there nothing everybody's winner Oh, it hasn't disappeared yet. Nope. We'll do one more drop and then we'll get started. How's that sound? Works for me. <laughs> Everyone's enjoying watching Clayton eat their pizza because he didn't have it delivered to everybody else. I ordered enough. Now I got to finish it on my own. I'm not sure you have to. <laughs> No, I have to. <laughs> I didn't get the two liter though, so I just got cans. Oh, I hear dogs. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Gonna <laughs> <laughs> gonna cross my fingers for a second. I may, I may have to go take care of that. <laughs> All right, well, we'll give it one one more minute or so, and then we'll start the presentation. Unless there's a dog issue that needs to be taken care of. Just bring the dogs in. People love watching dogs on stream. Well, they it, might be trying to get to out. It to have stopped. <laughs> no, usually it's the, um, the mail being delivered or something like that. Hmm. Oh, wait, here's one. Yeah, our delivery people sometimes enjoy ringing the doorbell, and then the dog just goes bonkers yeah we won't we won't tell if you're uh playing some kind of drinking game four miles 30 minute commute oh that's that's no fun what's the dog's name this is penny hi penny trying to keep her quiet this evening <laughs> Maybe she can answer some questions later on. We got another yes. 30 miles, four minute commute. How's that happen? That's either a fast car. Well, it's a dial in. You just. Or a bullet train, something. Okay, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, so as I said, I'm John Calloway, your host, Clayton Hunt, co-host 
And with us this evening, Jeremy Clark, going to talk about getting funky delegates in C Sharp. Uh, please do join us on meetup.com. Uh, join the group there, join the discussion. We have a face Facebook group. We also have a Twitter account that you could follow and get updates there. And of course, we are live streaming on Twitch and also YouTube, or do we back up to YouTube now? I've forgotten something. We also uh, have- We back up to YouTube. Yeah, so we also have the presentation to YouTube. So if you uh, miss it here, then you can also back up there. Uh, thank you, Virtual Boza. Following. Mm -hmm. Oh, I missed it. All right, so with that, here's Jeremy. Cool. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks to John uh -huh. and Clayton for inviting me. And there goes Penny again. She's, she's really going to be quiet this evening. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Okay, maybe I'm not so sure of it. <laughs> anyway, um, so I am in Washington State, so I'm I'm way across the country on the other side, about 40 miles from Canada. So um, it's a bit blustery, and I'm sure a lot cooler here than it is there. So, wow, my dog sounds like she's in distress. I'm going to have to bring her in and just put her on camera. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to be talking about delegates today, and it's one of those things that was difficult for me to learn as a developer and became really useful to me. And so uh, I always feel it's my responsibility to kind of share the, the things that I've learned because there's some things that are a, a little difficult, especially when you're first getting started with them. And the, uh, the, all the code I'm showing tonight, and I'm going to be showing mostly code because slides don't make me happy, that's uh, available from my website, jeremybytes.com. And if you go out there, you'll find a link to a GitHub repo that has all of the code in it. And then if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at jeremybytes as well. And uh, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat, but I'm going to rely on John and Clayton to keep me honest if I'm missing any questions. But please feel free to put questions in. Uh, that's way better than me just talking to my camera. So uh, with that, let's look at the two slides that I actually have. Uh, and really kind of the first thing that you run into when you're learning about delegates is first finding out what they are. because. Uh, when we look at what a definition is for delegate, it's a type that defines a method signature. So in C Sharp, we're used to types. Types are everywhere. We've got classes and you know uh, generic lists and strings and integers and all kinds of types, uh, which could be classes or structs or other things. What's a little different about a delegate is it's a type that defines a method signature. So it's really just the signature of a method. So it'll be the parameters and the return types. And that's it. There's no uh, body to it. And that's something we can assign to later on. So once you wrap your head around that, it starts to make a little more sense. And we're going to go to code to see that in action, because that's the only way I can make sense of it. But before going to code, just want to kind of talk about a few reasons why delegates are important in my world, especially. Uh, the first thing is for decoupling code. So the example that I show tonight, we're actually going to basically take some responsibility that we might normally stick in a class and give it to somebody else, make it somebody else's responsibility. And then if we need to change that in the future or we want to extend it, it's actually a lot easier. Uh, another thing that's really cool about delegates is we can use methods as parameters for other methods. And once you start getting used to this, it's uh, really interesting. And I should have warned you, delegates are kind of a gateway to functional programming. Because using parameters, uh, methods as parameters to other methods is really, uh, in the functional programming world, they would refer to that as a higher order function that takes uh, a function as a parameter. So uh, once you start getting used to that and it starts to look interesting, you kind of find yourself moving towards functional style programming. Another thing that's really cool in delegates in C-sharp is something known as multicasting. And what that means is that we can have a single delegate variable and assign multiple methods to it. And then when you invoke the delegate, meaning, hey, I want to run this code, it will run everything that's attached to it. And we've actually, we, I'll say we, you have probably seen that as event handlers. So when you hook up an event handler, 
I usually say, hey, plus equals add my own event uh, or my own event handler, I should say. And then when the event fires, all of those methods run. So an event is just a special kind of delegate. So multicasting is pretty cool in that regard. And then callbacks and event handlers, those are delegates. An event handler is just a special kind of delegate. And then one of my favorite things in C Sharp is Link, Language Integrated Query. And that uses delegates all over the place. Wow, I'm, is everyone else hearing that growling that's coming from my house? Okay, good. She'll be okay, I promise. <laughs> okay, so the good news is this is all the slides I have. And so we can go to code. And uh, I'm a fan of code, it's how I think. So that's what we're gonna do here tonight. Uh, again, if you go to my website, you can find a link to a GitHub repo. And this is a WPF project because I do desktop programming primarily. This is a .NET Core 3.1 project. So if you're using um, Visual Studio Code or .NET Core, then, um, or Visual Studio Code, I should say, <laughs> you can build and run this application. It is Windows only because it is WPF, but uh, all of this stuff that I'm showing you today is available on uh, Mac OS and Linux as well, since this is part of the language. So I have a few files that we're gonna be looking at tonight. One of them is this person class, or I should say this person file. And this consists of a couple things on, I'll, I'll actually start on line 36 where I have a person class. And this just uh, consists of a number of uh, properties and an override of the toString method. And then above this, on line six, I have a people class. And this has a method that will return a list of person objects. And if I were to pop this open, they're hard coded. So I'm not using a database or a web service. I just have some hard coded data. Now, before uh, kind of diving in a little bit more, let's look at what this application does. So when I run this and pop it open, on the left-hand side, we have the data, and that's coming from that hard-coded people collection that we just saw. And then in the middle, I have these radio buttons, which we're going to be dealing with the functionality on these. And then there's also a set of checkboxes as well. And by the time we're done, all of these will do something. Right now, this process data button doesn't do anything. That's what we're going to be filling in. Now, one thing I like about using delegates is it's a way for us to kind of outsource functionality. So I'm, I'm kind of, um, what I'm thinking of is I want to come up with different ways of outputting this person object. So I kind of want to override the two string method, but I want to be able to provide different formats for what I want that output to be. Now, rather than putting all of this code inside this person class itself, I'm going to create an override of the two string method that takes a delegate as a parameter. And that delegate can contain the functionality to turn that person object into a string. And that way we can basically do whatever we want with it from the outside, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so I talked about how a delegate is a type that defines a method signature. So I'm going to start by creating one of these types. And just like other types, we will give it a access modifier. So we'll say this is a public delegate. And for the method signature, this is going to take a person as a parameter and return a string. So we'll have a string as a return type. I'll call this person formatter. And it will take a person as a parameter. So what I've just done here is put in a method signature for this person formatter, but I've also declared a type. And this type now represents a method that takes a person as a parameter and returns a string. And you'll hear me say that a lot as we go through, <laughs> as we go through the evening. Okay, so now that I have this delegate, what can I do with it? Well, one thing that I'll do is I'll use it in the person class that I have uh, down below here. 
So I'm going to add a new two string method here. So we'll call it public, uh, we'll return a string, two string, and it will take a person formatter as a parameter. So we're actually taking this method, which again, any method that takes a person as a parameter returns a string, passing it into this two string method, and then we can use it in our code. And in order to use this in our code, what we want to do is known as invoking the delegate. And that just means we want to run whatever method is um, attached to this delegate. Now, before going any further, I want to talk a little bit about terminology because terminology does get strange when we're talking about delegates because we're dealing with methods, but we also have a type, which is the method signature, which is the delegate. And when we talk about classes, a lot of times we'll have a class like this person class, and then we'll have an instance of that class. Well, an instance of a delegate is, okay, I'm gonna have to pause because my dogs are going insane. I will be right back. <laughs> Bring them in. Talk Bring, amongst yourself. We, we wanna see the dogs. Any questions for Jeremy yet? Just be sure to add them to chat. Cliffhanger, right. Serenity now. <laughs> Any questions so far? Yeah, I know I really haven't gotten to the point where we can ask questions yet. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the terminology gets weird, so that's just a warning as we go forward. Uh, but in this method, the two string method, what I want to do is run this person formatter. And again, that's known as invoking the delegate. And to invoke a delegate, I take the formatter and I say dot invoke. And then if we use IntelliSense, we'll get a, uh, some help on how we actually use this. And really what we do, what we end up with is a method which matches our method signature. So you can say, when I say person formatter dot invoke, it's saying, hey, you know what? Give me a person object and then I will return you a string. Sorry, I need to catch my breath for a moment. <laughs> you know, when I actually visit user groups in person, I don't have that problem. <laughs> okay, so to invoke this delegate, I need to pass it a person parameter. Now, since I'm in a person class, I'm just going to pass it this. So I'll say, I want you to operate on whatever this instance is. And then since this invoke returns a string and my two string needs to return a string, I can just return the results that are coming back from here. And so now when I run this two string method and pass it in uh, a delegate, it will run that delegate and give me the string that comes out of it. And um, I'm going to be pointing out a little bit of some interesting syntax. <laughs> a lot of times we won't see this dot invoke syntax used because another way we can do this is to really treat this formatter delegate that we have like a method. So I can put formatter and then put uh, parentheses around it and uh, or around the parameters and call it just like any other method. Now I point out the dot invoke syntax because there's some places where you kind of have to use that other syntax. So uh, we'll see that a little bit later. Okay, so what I've just done is I've created a point where we can inject our own functionality into this person class. And so what I'm going to do is flip over to the form and actually do this. 
Now, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to be doing all of the code inside the code behind of the form. I generally don't code this way, uh, but in order to be able to focus on delegates, I'm going to keep this um, project as, uh, I'll say, the least amount of code possible so that we don't get lost in business rules or the MVVM design pattern or any kind of stuff like that. OK. So I have this process data button underscore click event handler, and that's hooked up to the button that's on our screen. Uh, now, actually, yeah, before I do anything else, <laughs> let's just get the button to do something. And so uh, for this, we'll start by getting a collection of person objects. So we'll say people dot get people. And again, that's the static method that we saw at the top of this file. So this will get me a collection of person objects. And then we'll for each over this. So for each person and people. And then you can see on line 23, I have an add to list method where I can put something into the output box. So we'll say person dot to string. And for now, I'm just going to use the default value. So this is the default for to string, I'm not using the delegate yet, just to make sure things are basically working. OK, so screen pops up, click the button. And now we can see we have the output on the right-hand side. And if we were to look at the values, we'd see that they match what's on the left as far as the format of the names and how they're coming out. Now, what if I want to change that output? I don't want to use the default. Well, I can create a method that matches the signature of my delegate and use that instead. So I'll create a private method that returns a string. And we'll call this output uh, family name. And it will take a person as a parameter. And we'll just say person uh, return person dot family name. And uh, actually, we'll just leave it at that. And now what I can do, if I look at the possible parameters for the two string method, I see there's the default one that we had before. But there is also an overload that takes the person formatter delegate type. And so I can put this output family name and pass it as a parameter to the choose string method. Now, one thing to notice here, I'm just uh, stating the name of the method, output family name. I'm not putting the parentheses. I'm not giving it a parameter. So I'm not actually calling the method. I'm passing the method to the choose string. And when we do this and run our application, now we see we just get the family name in the output box. So that's kind of mildly interesting, but um, you know, I, I'm not really seeing too much value yet. Well, let's take the next step on this. Since we can have, uh, since we have this delegate type, we can create variables that are of this type. So at the top of my class, we'll create a variable which is of type person formatter. And we'll call this format uh, formatter. And then down here in our code, we'll just assign formatter equal to output family name. And again, just assigning the name of the method itself, not actually calling it. And then we can pass the formatter variable to, uh, wow, I just can't type, can I? Lowercase, try that, try that. Fingers crossed. Oh, typed it wrong up there too. <laughs> I've got a trifecta going there on typos. OK, so now that they all match, uh, basically, what I did was I just added an intermediate variable. And as we'll see, intermediate variables can be pretty useful. And I, I know you've known me for 20 minutes, but just to show you, it still does the same thing. It still does the same thing. OK, so 
this is nice. And what it allows me to do is really extend this person class without having to modify the code itself. So uh, this actually fits into some of the solid principles. You might have heard of the open closed principle, where a class is open for extension but closed for modification. This is actually an example of that. I can extend this class by saying, OK, well, you can output yourself um, however you want, <laughs> basically, without having to change the code of the class itself. Now, obviously, I changed the code of the class to make that possible. But now, from now on, if I say, oh, you know what, I need a different format to output this in, I don't have to change the class itself. That has now been externalized. So we can extend it with further with uh, additional output types without having to change the class. So that's pretty cool. Uh, again, solid principles, single responsibility principle falls into this too, where we say, you know, a, a block of code should really only have one reason to change. And that can be translated as it should do one thing and do it really well. Well, what's the purpose of this person class? Well, not much, quite honestly. You could probably argue its job is to hold data, right? It holds these six properties that we have. But I would probably argue its job is not to figure out how to output itself. And so we're keeping it with its responsibility of, OK, I'm going to hold this data and hold it in an amazingly well way that will compare to nobody else. <laughs> and then it will be up to someone else to take care of this other functionality. So just kind of starting with, hey, really all we did was use a method as a parameter and we get these benefits. And that sounds kind of cool. And we'll actually see those more once we hook up those radio buttons. Now, what we've used so far is a custom delegate type. And the custom delegate, my custom type is person formatter. Just like on line 38, I have a custom type, which is a class, which is called person. So this is a type that I created myself. Now, a lot of times, we won't be using a custom delegate type. We'll use one that's built into the .NET framework. And that's where funk comes in. Have you seen funk of T uh, floating around? Yeah, that's where we can start using funk. And funk is really just a built-in delegate type in the um, C Sharp language. So let me look up funk of T in help. And we'll see we have this funk of t, t result. And let me zoom in on that, make it enormously big. <laughs> now, what we have here is a delegate. And it's declared just like I declared my delegate. So public delegate, the return type, which in this case is t result, the name of the delegate, which is actually this funk of t, t result. And then it's kind of hard to tell because of where the parentheses are, but that t arg, that's a parameter. And so basically, built into the framework, we have a delegate that has generic types already put in for us. And I'll show that by copying this to my clipboard and going back to the code. And I'm just going to line this up with the custom delegate that I created. So let's just add a little bit of space here. And we can see how this lines up. So it's really just taken a custom delegate that I would create and put in generic type parameters for it. So instead of string, the type is t result. And I could put in a, <laughs> a string for uh, the generic type if I want. And for the parameter, instead of having a person type, there's just a t type. And again, we can substitute whatever we want in there. And that's kind of neat. Uh, one thing I like about it is that means that I don't have to create custom delegates. <laughs> and when you look at the definition, in the middle of line 37 where the generic types are, you can see there's this in and out. Now, it's nice that, um, that these are here because I use them as reminders for what these things mean. Because the in really re refers to this is a parameter that's coming in. So the first one, t, that's our parameter coming in. And then t result has an out on it, and it's the type that's going out. Now, the in and out don't technically mean parameter and return type. What they technically 
have referred to is covariance and contravariance with generic types. And I'm totally not going to talk about that tonight, but it gives you an idea of, um, you know, the, the first one is the parameter and the second one is the return type. Now you might say, what if we have uh, methods that have more than one parameter? Well, that's fine because there's other um, uh, funks that are predefined. So there's a func of t1, t2, t result. And this takes two parameters in and has a return, uh, one return value. Now, up until .NET 4, uh, this was the most we had, which was func of t1, t2, t3, t4, t result. <laughs> And so if you had four parameters and a return type, this would work for you. Now, for whatever reason, um, I was hoping that in the next version of .NET, you know, there'd be a few more. And there actually are. Uh, now you can have this delegate. Um, yeah, so this is a method that has 16 parameters. Um, yeah, if you find yourself using this, please have a friend look at your code. I was really hoping that after this, there'd be one that took 64 parameters, but that didn't happen. So um, yeah, if you have a method that takes 16 parameters that you need to make delegates for, uh, um, a code review may be in order. I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it at that. And there is kind of everything in between. And there is actually a delegate that takes, um, a func that takes no parameters at all, and so this just is func of t result. So no parameters, but a return type. Um, I'm not exactly sure how useful that is in the real world, but it's in there. So what's nice is that we have these built into the framework, which means I don't have to create it myself. And so that means I can get rid of my custom delegate type. Okay, I'm just gonna comment those out, highlight the code, control KC is the default for that. Now, I need a replacement for this person formatter. Well, I'm going to use this func of t, t result. And again, my type coming in is of type person. And my return type is a string. So now I have a func of person string. This means exactly the same thing. I need a method that takes a person as a parameter and returns a string value. And you can see the code in here on line 50. It's perfectly happy with that. So again, it's telling me, hey, this needs a person as a parameter and it's going to return a string. Now back in my calling code, I just need to adjust this a little bit since this person formatter type no longer exists. I change this to a funk of person string and now everything will build and run and everything still works. And again, I'll just prove that. Do you trust me yet? <laughs> so now this gives us the same results that we had before, but now I don't have to use a custom type. Now there's two things I like about not having to use a custom type. The first thing is I don't have to create something new. I can use something that's already in there. The second thing I like specifically about using func is now I don't have to know quite as much about the delegate. So if I come down to line 31, where I'm calling the two string method and I need to pass a delegate into it, if I look at the uh, help that I get on the parameter, I see this is a func of person string. Now, previously we saw that the parameter we needed was a person formatter. Now, if I didn't know what a person formatter was, I would have to go looking for it. In this case, it says it's a func of person string. This is all the information I need. Okay, I need a method that takes a person as a parameter, returns a string. It's all there right in front of me and I don't have to think about it. So I, once you get used to funks, uh, they're awesome. <laughs> so um, I really like that. Okay, now this isn't real interesting because again, I'm kind of hard coding this delegate that I have on line 18. And my UI has some radio buttons in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a collection of methods that I can reference. So I'm going to create a new class and we'll call this formatters. 
And this will have a uh, set of static methods on it. So we'll create a public static class that has some public static methods on it. So I'll create a static method that returns a string. We'll call it uh, default. And it will take a person as a parameter. And I'll just return person's two string method that doesn't take any parameters at all. Okay, so we're gonna call the default two string method. Now, rather than you watching me type in the rest of these, I'm going to go to a snippets uh, file that is part of the solution. So you will get this if you download the code and just do a little bit of uh, pasting in so you don't have to watch me type. <laughs> and what I have now is a set of four different methods that all have the same method signature. So they all take a person as a parameter and they all return a string. So for the uh, on line 14, we have family name to upper, and that uppercase is the family name property. On line 19, we have given name to lower, and that lowercase is the given name. And then on line 24, we have full name, and that uses some string interpolation to do a family name, comma, space, given name. So notice these all take a person as a parameter and return a string, which means they all match the signature that we can put into our delegate parameter. And now I can make something much more interesting. So I'm gonna get rid of this manual method and create a new one. And this is going to return a funk of person string and I'll call this get formatter. And based on my UI, uh, so I would say like if the default string button is checked, then I will return formatters, formatters dot default. So just like we can have delegates as parameters in our methods, we can have parameters as return values for our methods. And so what I can do is based on the UI, I can pick out different methods. And again, I won't make you watch me type this in. <laughs> I'm gonna do a little bit of copy and paste from my snippets file. And this will just check the radio buttons that we have in the UI and return a different delegate. So on the first one, we'll look for the default string button and return the dot default method. Look, second one looks for the family name button, returns the family name to upper. The given name string button returns the given name to lower and the full name string button returns the full name. And then I have to have this null at the bottom just to make Visual Studio happy. But because we have radio buttons, the null should never happen. Okay, now one more thing I have to do before we run it is change this call on line 40. So again, we have this formatter variable, which is of type uh, func of person string. And I can uh, assign this to the result of the get formatter method that I just created. And so now the value of this formatter variable will be based on whatever radio button is checked in the UI. Let's see if this works. Fingers crossed. Okay. So the first one is the default. That is not very exciting, uh, but Let's try family name to uppercase or yeah, family name to uppercase. Yeah, look at that. Given name to lowercase and full name, which is family name, comma space, given name. Does that look a little more interesting? Now I'm actually picking the functionality of this method at runtime based on passing in a delegate. I think this is really cool and I get overly excited about this. So I apologize for that in advance. It might be too late to apologize for it in advance. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, some working delegates. I like that, but there's something that's really cool and trendy that we should be using here. And that is Lambda expressions. Lambda expressions. 
Now, I have an entire talk where I talk about lambda expressions, because even if you don't learn about lambda expressions, uh, even if you don't use lambda expressions yourself in your own code, you still have to understand them because 95% of the examples online use lambda expressions. <laughs> And most of the time in those examples, Lambda expressions are used as anonymous delegates. Oh, anonymous delegate. Wait, we have delegates. What's an anonymous delegate? Well, an anonymous delegate is basically, okay, the formal definition is it's a delegate without a name. So that should make 100% sense. <laughs> Let me show you what an anonymous delegate is. I'm going to go to this formatters uh, class where I have these four methods. And for the default method, I'm going to highlight the parameters and method body. Okay, so I'm grabbing the parameters and the method body. I'm going to copy that to my clipboard with a control C. And I'm going to come back to my code and on line 21, instead of using that formatters.default, I'm going to type in the delegate keyword and then paste. And what I've just done is inline that code. So now what we have is known as an anonymous delegate, which is a delegate without a name. <laughs> now, previously, again, this is where terminology gets confusing because our delegate was called default, but default is also the name of the method. And in this case, it's kind of both. <laughs> So again, the terminology gets really, really strange. Try not to think about it too hard. But what I've done is I've gotten rid of the, you know, formatter.default name and now have an anonymous delegate. Okay, so let's turn this into a Lambda expression. I said Lambda expressions are used as anonymous delegates a lot of the time. Here's how you do it. You delete the delegate keyword, and then between the parameters and the method body, you add the equals greater than sign, the Lambda operator. Ta-da, now you have a Lambda expression. Now I realize this doesn't look like a Lambda expression because it's way too readable. And uh, yeah, but this is actually a valid Lambda expression. But Lambda expressions were created back when we got link, a language integrated query. And the idea was that we could add all of this syntactic sugar to make this anonymous delegate syntax really, really small. And then that way we can stick them inside parameter uh, parentheses really easily and they don't take up much space. So that's the idea of why lambdas exist. So let's use some of the syntactic sugar to make this into something that looks more like a lambda expression. Uh, the first thing is something known as parameter type inference. If there's one thing you write down tonight, you should write down parameter type inference. The reason for that is when you say it in front of your boss, you sound really, really smart. But what parameter type inference means is if the compiler can figure out the parameter types of the Lambda expression, I don't have to type them in as a developer. So I can get rid of this person type on this uh, parameter. Now this person uh, parameter that I have is still strongly typed. If I hover over it, it is still a person. And if I try to say person dot, then I'll see all of the properties on a person object. So it is still strongly typed, but the compiler can figure out the type so I don't have to put it in. Now, how does it figure out the type? Well, I'm saying I'm returning a func of person string. And by definition, a func of person string has one parameter and it's of type person. It's the only thing I'm allowed to assign to this. So the compiler says, okay, I know this is a person object carry on. Another thing that's a convention with Lambda expressions is to use single character parameter names. Again, this is something that's not required. It's just a convention. Uh, okay, and I, I need to undo that because I want it to rename without, <laughs> I, I want my refactoring to work. Okay, control dot. No, I don't want to introduce a local. Okay, fine, make me rename it manually. Okay, so <laughs> I've just changed it to a single character. Now I'll usually use something to remind me of what it is. So since this is a person, I would be likely to use a P as that uh, parameter name. Again, 
strictly optional. You can name your Lambda expression variables, whatever you like. Another thing about Lambda expressions is if you only have one parameter, you don't need parentheses around it. Another thing about Lambda expressions is if you only have one expression, meaning one line that returns something, you don't need the curly braces or the return keyword. Does that look more like a Lambda expression? That actually means exactly the same thing <laughs> as what we just saw. Let me do that again a little bit faster so you can get an idea of how this works. So this family name to upper, again, I'll highlight the parameters and method body. I'll type in the delegate keyword and then paste to start out with. To turn it into a Lambda expression, remove the delegate keyword and add the Lambda operator between the parameters and method body. Because of parameter type inference, I can get rid of the person type. Uh, by convention, I can turn this into a single character parameter name. Since there's only one parameter, I can get rid of the parentheses around it. And since I only have one expression, I can get rid of the curly braces and the return keyword. And then once you get used to this, I'm comfortable, I've been doing this for a while, and then you can just start typing it in yourself. Okay, so in this case, we'll say p goes to p.givenName.2 uh, lower. And um, I'm just comfortable typing this in because I'm familiar with Lambda expressions. Uh, let's see, this was string interpolation. Um, and oh, we'll say uh, p. Uh, family name, and then comma space p.givenName. Does that look right? That looks right. And so what I've done is I've taken those four methods and inlined them. Oh, let's, let's see if this still works. How, how do you feel? Oh wait, you know what? I know you don't trust me. I'm going to comment out this entire four matters class to show you there's no me secretly calling something else here. Okay, four matters class is gone those methods no longer exist in my code. So now we just have the inline methods. Okay, the default, okay, not impressive. Uh, family name to upper, mm. given name to lower, family name comma space given name. That's pretty cool. <laughs> now in this situation, since all of these methods are one liners, I like the Lambda expressions better uh, for this situation. Because what we had before with the formatters.default, formatters.given name to upper, if I wanted to know what it was doing, I'd have to go look up that method in another class. Here, I have exactly the same number of lines of code, okay? I have one line for each of these return statements, but now what I'm doing is right here in front of me. And again, once I'm comfortable and I understand Lambda expressions, uh, this looks very natural. So I would highly encourage you to learn Lambda expressions because they're pretty cool. Are there any questions on that so far? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I'll take that as a move forward because <laughs> we've got other cool stuff to show. Um, let me go back to the UI and we'll, oh, that's cool. It decided to come up on a different monitor. In addition to the string handling radio buttons that I have, I also have some checkboxes for some actions. And let me just talk about what I want to do here. Okay, so for average rating, uh, you'll notice that each of these items has a star rating. So John Koenig has six out of 10 stars. Taranga Leela has eight out of 10 stars. So what I wanna do is I wanna go through all of the items in the list and calculate the average of the rating field and put it in my output box. Uh, for the second one, earliest start date, I wanna go through all of the items in the list, find the one that has the earliest start date chronologically, put that into the output box. For best commander, I wanna go through all of the items in the list, find the one that has the highest rating value, and I wanna put that commander's name into a message box that pops up. And then for first letters, this one's a little arbitrary. I want to go through all of the items in the list, take the first letter of the family name, 
for each item and output it into the output box. Okay, now these are also checkboxes. So I can do multiples of these at a time as opposed to the radio buttons where I was just picking one thing at a time. Okay, how do we do this? Well, thinking about the type of delegate I need to create here, uh, the first thing is I'm not really returning something. When I was looking at the string handling, again, takes a person as a parameter and returns a string. Okay, so that delegate returns a string that we can then put into the output box. But instead, these actions are now performing some kind of work. So I don't want them to actually uh, return a value. I want them to do the work. I want them to output to the output box. I want them to pop up a message box. That's what I want the delegates to do. So in this case, func doesn't really make sense because func returns a value. Well, if we go back to help, we'll see that func has a uh, sibling, which is action of t. And the action of t delegate looks a lot like the func, but the difference is it returns void. So in this case, I have action of t, and in this case, t is a parameter, but it returns void, so it doesn't return a value. And just like with func, you can have an action that takes 16 parameters and returns void. Um, yeah, please don't do this. <laughs> and there is also an action that takes no parameters and doesn't return anything. So, um, you know, all kinds of permutations that are built in. Okay, so let's think about um, if I were to create a variable to represent this, what, it what would it look like? Well, we'll say private action. Now, what would this take as a parameter? Well, when I was talking about averaging the values, finding the best commander, what I started out by saying is we're going to go through all of the items in the list to find out what we want to do. So in this case, I want to have the list of person as a parameter for this particular method. Okay, this is where things get fun because if I say I want an action with a list of person as a parameter, then um, I end up with nested generic types, which is fun. <laughs> and uh, let me just go to my notes to see what I named this. We call, I call this processor. That's a good name for this. And I actually need to bring in a using statement for list. So uh, I'll control dot on that. Let Visual Studio bring in that using statement for me. And so now what I've created is a delegate that represents a method that takes a list of person as a parameter and returns void. OK. Are you excited to use this? I'm excited to use this. Unfortunately, I'm too excited to use this because before I use this, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping because I only want this to happen when the various uh, UI elements are expanded. So uh, for what we've written so far, I'll say if the string expander is expanded, then we'll do the code that I wrote previously. And then if the action expander, that's the UI element, is expanded, then uh, we'll uh, do something else. <laughs> OK. So let's do this something else. I'll go ahead and collapse our get formatter method because I want to be able to see the type that we have at the top on line 13. OK, now for this one, rather than returning a value, which I might want to do later on. But for now, I want to assign to this processor variable. So my initial method will return void, and we'll call this assign action. And then based on what we have in, um, well, before we do the UI, uh, let's just say processor plus equals, and then we'll say p goes to add to list. So we put something in the output list. I'm not going to expect you to follow the Lambda expressions I'm creating right now. Uh, uh, p dot, uh, come on. P dot, oh, why am I not getting IntelliSense here? Average, there we go. Uh, 
R goes to R dot rating. There we go. Okay, my IntelliSense is not uh, keeping up with me here. Dot to string. There we go. Okay, that looks good. Okay, so, so what I'm using is I'm using a link method called average and passing it in the rating property. So we'll take the average of all of the ratings and then we're gonna output that to a string since that'll be a number and then we'll add it to the list. Okay, so before hooking up the radio buttons, let's just do a hard coded one, see how this works. Okay, so I will need to collapse and expand to get to, oh, one other thing. I need to actually call this assign action method. <laughs> this thing that said do something else? Yeah, I need to do something. <laughs> okay, so we'll call assign action. And uh, actually that's all we need to do because uh, again, this code has the add to list in it, the, la uh, the Lambda expression we created. Okay, so Let's collapse and expand and click the button. Oh, and there's nothing there. What did I do wrong? Uh, oh. So I'm assigning the action to the delegate, but I'm not invoking it. There was something else I needed to do. <laughs> I need my processor variable at the top and uh, this needs a list of person. And fortunately, we have a, a person collection already on line 47. Okay, so invoking the delegate is helpful if you wanna actually do something. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so assign action will assign the action to our delegate field that we have on the class. And then on line 59, we'll actually invoke that delegate to run it. And uh, now it should do something. <laughs> Whenever I do this talk, I always miss two or three steps along the way. Okay, look, we have data, woohoo. Okay, I like to see that. Uh, what happens if we click the button again? Uh, okay, now I have two. Click the button, now I have three. Okay, Jeremy, you must be really bad at clearing out list boxes. Um, no, actually, if you notice, on line 45 here, every time I click the button, I clear the list box. So why is this happening? Well, I just showed you multicast delegates and you probably weren't paying attention. Let me come back up here to the assign action and on line 40, you'll notice I used a plus equals when I was assigning to the delegate. So again, very similar to how if you hook up your own event handler, you do plus equals on the event so that your, um, uh, your event handler gets added to the list of potentially other event handlers. And so what's happening is the first time I click the button, it assigns this Lambda expression to the processor variable. The second time I click the button, it assigns another one to the same variable, so now there's two. The third time I click the button, it assigns another one, so now there's three. And then when I invoke the delegate, again, down here on line 59, way at the bottom, it runs all three of those. That's pretty cool, I like that. Now, obviously I have a problem because that's not, this is not the behavior I want here. Uh, and a way we can fix this is at the top of this assignment, I can just set processor equal to null and that will just remove everything that's assigned to it. So now each time I click the button, it will clear out the processor variable assign the one Lambda expression that we have to it, the one delegate. And so if I click it multiple times, we'll always just have one in there. Okay, now check boxes. I wanna hook up these check boxes. Now again, lucky for you, uh, you don't have to watch me type this because this one would be really tedious. <laughs> I have some checkboxes uh, or some code to check the checkboxes already in place. So I'm going to keep the null in there at the top and then uh, check uh, based on the checkboxes. So for the first one, if the average rating checkbox is checked, 
then I will take this plus equals to assign it to our processor field that we have. And this does what I had earlier. So add to list, it runs an average on the rating property. And then it two strings this. And in this case, I gave it a string format. So it only do one decimal place. For the second one, the earliest start date, again, uh, the plus equals. So we're adding something else to our uh, field, our delegate field. We have the add to list. And in this case, on line 48, I'm using the min function, uh, which again is another uh, link method that we have. Link is awesome. I'm doing min on the start date property and then outputting that uh, to a short date format. For uh, line 50, we have the best commander. And in this case, notice on line 51, I'm doing a message box dot show. So rather than adding it to the list, we're going to have a pop-up box. And in this case, I do order by descending on the rating. And that will give me the highest rated one at the top. And then the dot first will give me the first element, which will give me the highest rated item. And then I can do a two string on that. And it will use the default two string method for the person object, stick that into the list box or I'm sorry, into the uh, message box. And then for the last one, again, plus equals. Now, in this case, I have multiple lines, so I've got curly braces around it. And, uh, and what I'm doing is I'm using a for each to take the first character of the family name for each of the items and just put it into one string. And then on line 59, I take that and stick that output on, uh, into the output box. Okay, and if you don't understand those Lambda expressions, that's perfectly okay. I don't expect you to, but I wanna show you, you can do some pretty cool stuff just in line. Okay, let's see how I'm feeling. I'm gonna do them one at a time to start with. Okay, average rating, okay, 6.6, .6. I like that. Okay, earliest start date. Okay, I've got October 17th, 1975. Okay, that sounds good. Best commander. Uh, I get a pop-up, let me zoom in. Okay, got a pop-up with Dave Lister in it. And if I look, I see, uh, where is Dave? Dave's this green one here and he has nine out of 10 stars. And then if I do first letters, I have the first letters of the family names <laughs> uh, and it's going across. So it's going Koenig, Hunt, and actually Taronga is the family name for Tarongalila. Crichton, Lister, Roslyn, Sheridan, Montana, Gampu. So it's giving me the first character of the family names for everybody. Okay, let's run them all at the same time. This is the magic of multicasting. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Brace yourself. Ta-da, they all ran at the same time. Sort of, not really. So you'll notice that the first letters one hasn't run yet. <laughs> and that's because a message box is a blocking operation. That's a modal dialog, which means no code is processed until I clear this message box. Now, if I say, okay, then we'll see that, the, that those letters pop up. This is something that you, that's important to understand when you're talking about multicast delegates. There's no magical threading happening. It's not like, oh, each of these gets their own thread, they run in parallel, blah, blah, blah. Nope, none of that happens. <laughs> what happens is each method is run in the order that it's assigned to our delegate. So in this case, they're assigned in the order that we see here. So the average rating runs, once it's done, the earliest start date runs, then the best commander runs, and again, modal dialog, so it pauses. And then when I click OK, the first letters runs. And just to show that it is the order that they're assigned, I'm going to take the best commander's assignment and move it to the top of the method. So that'll be the first one that we assign. And this will make it uh, much more clear because now, I check all of them and we get the pop-up. None of the other ones run. And then when we click OK, the other methods run. Okay, so very important, no magical threading. They run in the order that they're assigned. The side effect of this is that if one of these methods throws an exception, the other methods will not run. Yeah, that's... It, it may be okay, it may not be okay, depending on what your scenario is. 
something to be aware of. Now, if you want to um, learn about how to deal with exceptions to say, okay, well, I want to make sure everything has a chance to run, even if one of them throws an exception, I have some blog articles. So um, if you go and follow the links to the GitHub project, again, you can get there from, well, let me just show you. That'll be the easiest thing to do. Uh, so again, jeremybytes.com. And we're here, uh, stpete.net. But if you go to the presentation tab, then this is going to stay here. So it'll scroll down as I do more presentations, but it, that link is not going away. So if we click on that, there is actually a set of articles here that you can look at. But then you can also go to the GitHub repo, which actually has those same set of articles in the readme. <laughs> and then we can see here I have an article for exceptions in multicast delegates and more delegate exception handling. If you want to, again, depending on what you need to do, there's different techniques that you can use for that. So uh, now you have homework. <laughs> okay, now there's one other thing I wanna show. What happens if we don't have anything assigned at all? Well, I get an exception. And it's everyone's favorite exception, right? The null reference exception, object reference not set to an instance of an object. Uh, so yes, this is something to be aware of, particularly if you're doing this multicasting like we have here. Uh, let's stop debugging. And what's happening in this situation is at the top of the assign action method on line 40, I'm setting our processor field to null, so I'm clearing it out. And because none of the checkboxes are checked, nothing gets assigned. So when we're down here on line 79, I'm trying to invoke a null delegate. And that's where we get the null reference exception. Now, uh, there is actually a fairly easy fix to this, but it doesn't work with this syntax. I have to go back to the dot invoke syntax that we saw earlier. And what we're going to use is we're going to use uh, the null coalescing operator. So I can say processor question mark dot invoke. And now what happens is if processor is null, it's going to stop. It's not going to call dot invoke on it. It'll just say, OK, it's null. I'm not going to do anything. And we can actually see that. OK, and we'll just check nothing. OK, no exceptions. That's good. I can still click uh, average rating, so it still works. But if nothing is assigned, no exceptions. That's good. Now, it's not possible to use this syntax. Uh, so if you try to do something like this, where you say processor question mark and then the parentheses, uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> so if you do want to do this, you will need to use the dot invoke syntax in order to run this. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And in fact, I'm going to go back to my person class and fix this because somebody could pass a null in as a, as a parameter to this two string method. And what do we do? Well, again, if we try to run it right now, we'll get a null reference exception bad things happen, right? We want to avoid that. In this case, I'll do something a little bit different. I'll check to see if formatter equals null. And then what, I, what I'm going to do is just come up with a good default thing to do. So rather than do nothing, I'm going to say, oh, well, you know what? This class has a default to string method. So if you don't assign your own custom delegate, I'm going to do the default to string. That makes perfect sense for this particular object. And so uh, in this case, you know, if it's null, we do the default uh, to string. If it's not null, we'll invoke the delegate that comes in. So things to keep in mind. <laughs> now, I do want to make uh, a few more changes to my assign action method because I want to get rid of this class level uh, field. I don't actually like that. I kind of feel a little bit better about 
uh, like on line 21, where we had the get formatter method that just returns the delegate rather than assigning it somewhere. I kind of like that idea. So this assign action, I want it to return the delegate rather than assigning to some class level field. So we'll just do a little modification here. So we'll say that this returns an action of list a person. And instead of calling it assign action, I'll call it get action. Uh, we'll just rename it to something a little more appropriate. And then up here, we'll say, okay, we'll have an action of list of person, which I'll call action, set it to null at the top. And I'm intentionally renaming this. Instead of using processor, I'm using action, just so it's really clear, oops, that I'm using this local variable as opposed to that class level field that I had before. And then down at the bottom, we will return that uh, method level variable. OK, so the change to our code. And uh, to start with, I'm going to reintroduce the processor variable, <laughs> which seems kind of weird. But now it's, it's actually local. So if we look at this again, it tells us this is an action of list of person. But now it's just this little local variable that we're using on line 79 and 80. It's not something that's at the class level. And if we do this, we'll see that our code behaves the same way. So uh, let's just check everything except the one that does the uh, message box. <laughs> and then we'll see this all still works. Now, the reason I'm kind of showing you this is because once you start getting into more functional style programming, again, delegates are kind of the gateway drug for that. So uh, sorry if I got you hooked. <laughs> it's very common to just pass functions around. Okay, so we're passing them as parameters. We're returning them as return types. And um, I know I've been pretty loose with the terminology method and function. In the C-sharp world, we don't usually make distinctions between methods and functions. In the functional programming world, there's a definite distinction between them. And I'll leave that as something to, uh, for you to investigate further. <laughs> um, but in this case, it's very common to say, OK, well, here's something that takes a function and returns a function. We can use this function for something else. We can assign to it. Uh, and um, away you go. But what that also leads to is some syntax that you can use to hurt your coworkers. So um, does anyone here not like their coworkers? Because if you don't like your coworkers, here's something you can do. And that is this processor variable. This is technically an intermediate variable that I don't need. And I can even use the Visual Studio um, help. I don't have ReSharper or anything. I just have the Visual, uh, Visual Studio refactoring. And I can inline this temporary variable. So processor is a temporary variable. Um, yeah, uh, is this going to confuse anybody on your team? <laughs> so what's happening here is the get action returns an action of list of person, which may or may not be null. And so we do the question mark dot and invoke whatever's coming back from this get action uh, method. So I usually tell people, you know, do not do this, you know, unless you hate your coworkers. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can do it. And I really like link in case I haven't said that enough here. I actually have a talk that I do that shows how to use the uh, fluent syntax for link. And link is all about, if you look at the, the method signatures, they're all about funk. You know, there's funk of t, uh, uh, t, t result everywhere in link. And so you really have to get used to this idea of delegates and lambda expressions. And basically what I think of is whenever I see a funk, like in a method signature, I kind of treat it as a big flashing sign that says, put your Lambda expression here. So uh, that's the way I treat it. So in link, 
uh, I love just dotting the methods together. Okay, so I have a local collection. I say, hey, dot where this condition, dot order by this condition, do a dot then by as a subsort, and then maybe a dot select so that I can do a transformation on the object. So uh, dotting methods together gets uh, kind of interesting once you get used to it. But I, I won't say the syntax on line 81 is evil. But what I will say is you definitely need to have uh, developers in your organization that are very comfortable with delegates and using them as return types and so forth. Oh, wow. That is actually my whirlwind tour of delegates that I have for you. Let's see uh, what topics I kind of hit. Uh, decoupling code. So actually, we actually saw how we could take um, the uh, string formatting functionality outside of the person object, and we could inject it through um, through a delegate. And uh, we saw how we could use methods as parameters uh, to other methods, and we could use Lambda expressions as well. Actually, let me just show you that because it's kind of interesting. So on line seventy five, again, we have this uh, two string. What if I wanted to just put something custom in here and I didn't want to go through this whole separate variable, uh, this formatter field and this get formatter method? What if I just wanted to hard code something? Well, I could just say p goes to p dot uh, rating. Um, actually, let's just do a dollar sign quote. Let's do this. p dot rating and then uh, p dot start date like that. And I can actually put this in line without having to call something else. And again, Lambda expressions, they're made to be really small and stick in there. What is that going to do? Hey, that actually worked. <laughs> so, you know, kind of once you get used to this and you get used to Lambda expressions and everything else, it's actually really, really cool. I'm overly excited, I realize that. Um, we saw multicasting where you can have one delegate variable that has multiple methods assigned to it and they all get run when you invoke that delegate. So that's pretty cool. Uh, callbacks and event handlers, I talked about those but we didn't exactly see those uh, this evening. And then link language integrated query, I actually used a lot of link. The average, the min, uh, some of the other methods that I was using, that's all link. And it's all really, really cool. Uh, now, before I leave you, I'll just um, talk about another of the articles that I have uh, on the uh, source materials. And that is this last one that says, named delegates compared to anonymous delegates. There are some differences between using a named delegate and an anonymous delegate. So for example, uh, when I'm doing this plus equals to assign the anonymous delegate to our delegate variable, there's no way to do a minus equals on an anonymous delegate. So if this had a name, so let's say where we're using the separate formatter.default that we had before, formatters uh, give a name to upper, um, that doesn't fit into here, but we'll say it does. If you use a plus equals with a named delegate, you can use a minus equals to remove it later. And uh, you know that's sometimes we'll see that in event handlers where people will say, well, after you hook up your event handler, unhook it before you're done so that stuff gets freed and whatnot. There's no way to do a minus equals when you use an anonymous delegate. So that's one difference between named delegates and anonymous delegates. I'm just throwing that out there because again, I'm giving you homework. So other things to investigate. <laughs> okay, with that, are there any questions that I didn't get along the way? There was a question a little while back. Uh, so Freakin' Ward asked, so we should be able to perform sync side effects. Um, I think where, while you were showing that if uh, one of the uh, methods threw an exception or something, then, then there could potentially be side effects. And I think Clayton attempted answering it as well, but just wanted to see if you had additional thoughts. Uh, yes, there are definitely side effects. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, 
definitely go through those articles that I mentioned about the the dele the exception handling with delegates because that will give you an idea of how to deal with it. So the short version is if I have uh, an invoke, let's uh, say that on line 81, where I'm invoking this multicast delegate, if one of them throws an exception, I can wrap this in a try catch block and that will catch the exception. But again, the additional delegates will not run. There's a way, which is actually one thing that I show in the article where you can actually get into the delegate list of the delegate. And basically what you can do is do a for each over that and wrap each of those in a try catch block <laughs> so that if something goes wrong, it doesn't stop the other ones from running. And then you can catch all of the exceptions that happen. So like if three of them throw exceptions, you'd be able to catch those and do something with them. Kind of the best thing to do is not have delegates that can throw exceptions. <laughs> you know, especially in the multicasting world. Um, and actually there's one other thing I wanna say about multicasting and that is multicasting only makes sense for actions, meaning something that returns void. Now, the reason for that is let's say I have a multicast delegate that returns something, okay? Let's say I took the, the string formatting and I said, you know what, this is going to be multicasting now. So all of these methods are going to run and they're all going to return a string. What do you get back when you invoke a multicast delegate? Well, you only get one return type or one return value, I should say. And the return value you get is the return value of the last delegate to run. <laughs> so if I have four things that are assigned as a multicast delegate, they all return strings and I invoke the delegate, I'm only gonna get the return value from the last one. So in that scenario, multicasting doesn't really make sense for something that returns a value, but if you have something that's performing an action, it can be very useful. Sweet. And Virtual Boza asks, um, when your talk on in and out would be oh. for covariance versus contravariance? Okay, so I haven't written that talk yet. <laughs> but if it's on the request list, I will write it. It's actually uh, something I've been thinking about for a while because I do have actually a YouTube series on generics, which is kind of, um, it's more getting started and understanding how generics work. And I don't get into covariance and contravariance there because that's, uh, I would say, more intermediate level than that particular uh, topic is. Uh, but okay, now that someone requested it, it goes to the top of the list of blog articles I need to write about. So thanks for giving me homework. Okay. <laughs> and Coder Cat is, <laughs> has commented dictionary of string comma funk of T or funk of int, sorry. Uh, dictionary of string funk of int. That's perfectly valid. You can have, you can have a dictionary that has delegates as the values. There's nothing wrong with that. I've actually used so, something very similar to that. How have you used it? Um, it was for a repository pattern over top of Entity Framework mm, uh, okay. as a way to store um, uh, includes. So like when you mm. include uh, some nested value, like the address of a, of a person or something. Um, and so you would include, it adds it to the dictionary and then tax it onto the entity framework statement when you execute a query as opposed to just right away. Yeah, and actually that's one of the cool things about delegates because it's a type. So I, I won't say 100% true, but more or less anywhere you could put a type such as a class or a struct, you can put a delegate. So yeah uh, <laughs> once you once you start thinking about it you're like there's a lot of things i can do with this yeah yeah i've got a cash manager class that i've been playing with recently that takes in a funk of task of t <laughs> and another method that takes in a funk of task of an i enumerable of t so i might want to get some eyes on that because i think yeah. <laughs> i'm going cross-eyed sounds good 
yeah well task is another topic that i talk about and uh yeah understanding task and then task has its own funks when you're talking about continuations and then if you have funks of tasks that can theoretically have continuations with funks of return types <laughs> All right, any more questions for Jeremy? I know that it's still, what is it even still daylight in Washington State these right now? It is actually still daylight because it's almost 5.30 here. Um, we're getting sunset around 6.30ish now, I think. It's weird because again, I, I've spent most of my life in Southern California, which is closer to where you are as far as latitude is concerned um i'm 1200 miles north and so we go from like you know sunset at 10 p.m to sunset at like 4 p.m <laughs> depending on what time of year it is so uh yeah all right and virtue of boza is asking any reason to prefer and in, prefer invoking with parentheses versus invoke parentheses i think you had shown an example but is yeah there one there's a reason to prefer one over the other there really isn't. Uh, I actually prefer the um, parentheses because it's really treating, uh, like we have here on line 52, because it's really treating this delegate as a method, which is what it is. So I like that. It feels very natural. If I do need to do something like the null check, then I will step outside of that and use the dot invoke. But other than that, I, I prefer the parentheses syntax. All right. Any more questions? Um, we'll, we'll, this video will remain up on Twitch. I think we're in, in the two week mark uh, and then Twitch will take it down, but we are backing up to YouTube. So uh, if you don't find us on Twitch, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, and of course, find us on meetup, join the meetup group. Um, be sure to RSVP to all of our uh, meetings, follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube, join us on Facebook groups. Uh, with that, we are going to be back in two weeks talking about something. Uh, so we've got an, an extra special meet meeting in October since we had a wealth of offerings to have different events. So in two weeks from today on Tuesday, October 27th, 7 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have Steve Lorello talk about an introduction to computer vision and .NET. And then next month, Tuesday, November 10th, we're going to have Michael Stark talking about Azure Bot Composer. And we are setting up additional meetings in December and looking for next year. So if anybody has any specific topics they want to hear about, uh, if they want to hear from any specific uh, speakers, if you want to volunteer yourself or a coworker, then be sure to let us know. We'll always be glad to accept any and all presentations. Clayton's hair and beard right now is like 11 out of 10. It, yeah. He's got the COVID hair and beard going on. This is a tame day. Like it's actually <laughs> staying where I put it today <laughs> for the most part. And of course we've, uh, we have forked Jeremy's repo in our, in the St. Pete.net meetup GitHub account as well. So if you lose track of it somehow and, and can't find him anywhere on, on the internet, which I can't imagine that would be the case, Jeremy Bytes, Twitter handle, jeremybytes.com website and links to the presentations there. Um, wealth of knowledge this has been a great presentation. Very, very thorough, really appreciate it. Uh, with that, if there are no more questions, we can let Jeremy return to his early evening and let everyone in Eastern time zone return to their mid-evening. Uh, but with that, please uh, please do, if you are on Twitch here, uh, on the live recording, please do like and subscribe and, and do all the fun things that you're supposed to do on Twitch. If you have an Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe to us and get notified when when we're coming on and it's free for you and we get special twitch credit or something i don't we're still relatively new to twitch but with that we do appreciate everyone joining and all the great questions and collaboration and and reaching out and uh, 
communicating and being involved. Um, very, very big thanks to Jeremy. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me. I had a great time. All right, and we will do the Twitch thing and we will raid some peoples. <clears throat> it looks like we shall do the rating of AI Swigert. Looks like doing some Python stuff. So with that, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>